I'm just kind of surprised to see my friend Joseph Bose there, and I turned around and took a little bit of time to shake his hand. Let us turn now in the Word of God, the Hebrews, the first chapter. I want to read for a portion the first, second, and third verse, or uh, to draw a text for the night. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Let us bow our heads now for prayer. Now, in his divine presence, if you have any requests that you'd like to be made known to him, would you just raise up your hand? And that's your request that God will... Our Heavenly Father, we are coming now uh, up before thy throne by faith in the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son. And we have been given this assurance that if we ask anything in his name, it'll be granted. And thou knowest our desires and our needs, and thou hast promised that you would supply all that we have need of. So, Father, we would pray as you taught us, thy kingdom come, thine will be done in earth as it is in heaven, that our request tonight might be according to your desire to give it, and grant to us these privileges. Anoint the word, Lord, and all the speakers and the hearers, and may the Holy Spirit come in and be the doer of the word tonight among us, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Be seated. Tomorrow morning, I understand, is the full gospel businessman's breakfast. Usually where they have a chapter, I have the privilege of speaking at their breakfast. To this time, that's the only organization, which is not an organization, but the only group that I, I belong to, is the Christian businessman. And now I just speak for him internationally. Now tonight, we're trusting that this gathering will not be in vain. I've come to you a tired, a worn-out throat, and received a little bronicle from... I come from Tucson, where it's really good and dry, and I come here, it's really good and wet. <laughs> so there's quite a contrast. And if you all got all the water over here, if you just send it over our way, we'd appreciate it. But you can't do that, of course. But I'll tell you one thing. It's a parable there. All of our, our, our things in Arizona, our trees, is full of stickers. Everything has a sticker. It's because it's dry. Now, if that same bush growed over here, it'd be a nice, lovely leaf. See, it's without water. That's the reason it becomes a sticker. And when the church becomes without the water of life, it gets dry and sticky, too. Sticking and punching at everything. But where the waters of life flows, it opens up the leaf and makes it tender, mellow, and sweet, holy, and acceptable unto God. So may the Lord God water us tonight that we won't be stickers. But we'll be fine leaves that the wayward people might sit down under the tree of our shade and find rest to their souls. Now, I want to take the text tonight, if the Lord willing, and I'm pulling this little microphone just as close as I can because of the lack of voice. I want to, from the reading here of Hebrews 1.1, I want to take a text of God identifying himself by his characteristics. May I repeat that again because I know these acoustics is bad here. God identifies himself by his characteristics. Now, most anything is identified by its characteristics. Now, I have a few scriptures here that would, and note that I would like to refer to. Now, a characteristic of anything identifies what it is. Now, uh, like in all nature, flowers are identified many times by their characteristic. If they're close together of one species to another, 
the characteristic of that flower will uh, identify what flower it is. And in wildlife, many times uh, I, I'm a hunter, and you have to know the characteristic of the animal that you're hunting, or sometimes you can be certainly uh, deceived. For instance, like the stone sheep way up in British Columbia. I was just under the Yukon this last fall. A couple of brethren here now was with me, and we were hunting. Now, if you didn't know the difference when you was tracking a sheep or a deer, you couldn't tell the difference unless you was a shrewd hunter, because they make the same kind of tracks. They bound when they run away, and then you see one standing in a distance with his head hid. Why, well, you, you would hardly know the difference. They're about the same size across the rump part. It's white, just like the deer. It'd be very hard to tell them. But his horns identifies his characteristic for them horns. The sheep has a horn that rounds, and a deer has prongs that run out. And another thing, a deer wouldn't go quite that high to feed. And then the goat walking also is a characteristic in a goat and a sheep that you'd have to know the difference in them when you were up high because they both dwell high in the mountain. You uh, have to know the difference, but if you notice, a, wa- a goat stumbles himself as he walks, where a sheep sets his feet down like this as he walks. The characteristic of the way he makes his track, you identify your game by the characteristics of what it does and how it acts and what it feeds and everything. It identifies itself by its characteristic. And then you jump on and watch what happens. You can tell the way they go. Uh, you can tell by that characteristic of different animals. Then did you ever notice, I don't know where you have them here or not, yellow hammers. Well, the thicker is the right name for them. And a jaybird. A jaybird is about the same size of a yellow hammer. And you see the two flying. They're both about the same kind of bird. If you can't see the color, but just watch them, you can tell which is the yellow hammer. The jaybird flies more or less in a bee line, but the yellow hammer flopping his wings. As he flaps his wings, he goes down and then up, down and then up. So he makes himself in a bound like that, and you can tell that's a characteristic of the yellow hammer, the way he flies. If you notice the, the quail, when he comes out, the way he comes up, and then watch if you're in a swamp where a quail might be in a, in a knife, you hunters know that, the Wilson's knife and the Jack's knife, they identify themselves by the way they come out, the way they go. They identify by their characteristic of flying, of what kind of a bird they are. Therefore, if you just heard him, you can just tell what it was the way he went out, what he is by the characteristic of his flying. Like a man and a woman, they're both human beings, but a woman has a different characteristics to a man. I was reading here some time ago about Solomon and the queen. I've never got around to preaching in my little message here to you on the queen of the south, uh, coming up to see Solomon and seeing that gift of discernment. I was reading about that here not long ago, and they said that one of the puzzles that was put before Solomon was this queen took a woman, or women rather, and dressed them like man. Now, that was foreign in that day, but it certainly is up to date today. And, and you know that's wrong. The Bible said that a woman shouldn't do that. It's an abomination for a woman to put on a garment that pertains to a man. The unchangeable God said that. So that is true. So we find out that Solomon no more than watched him. He had him to walk or do something, and immediately says, Women. See, you could tell by the characteristic of that woman, the way she handled herself, that she was woman and not man. And then most anything that way with his characteristics is like uh, many people are left-handed and right-handed. Their characteristic, the way they handle themselves, you can tell whether it's a right or the left hand person by the way they conduct themselves and the way they reach out, always with that left hand or the right hand. And remember, Jesus had something like that, that two hands are just almost, they are the same. They've got the same kind of thumbprints, fingerprints, five fingers, small index and so forth. Just as the right hand and the left hand has the same kind of fingers normally, same size hand, just exactly. And the only difference there is in them is one is left and the other is right. That's the only difference you can tell. One is left 
other night. So then in that, Jesus said, I might drop a little point here. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the characteristics of the Spirit would be somewhat alike in the last days. So close that would deceive the very elected if it was possible. See, that just you take your hand and just hold it up. See, if you don't notice, one of them looks like the other in every way, but one of them is left and the other is right. That's the way the spirits are in the last day. They're somewhat alike, but they have a characteristic that identifies them. One is right and the other is wrong. And it can be identified by its characteristic. The Spirit of God can be identified by its characteristic. See, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the church is a church spirit. And a Spirit of God is absolutely not like the church spirit at all. There's a denominational spirit. There's a national spirit. There's a spirit of the nation. Every nation, when I go into you, you walk in there, you find a different spirit. I went into Finland, fine people, but there was a Finnish spirit. I go down into Germany, there's a German spirit. You're not long ago, I was going with the wife, when we still lived in Indiana a couple of years ago, over to the uh, little supermarket. I just come home, we had to go get some food. And on my road over there, we, it's the summertime, you might not believe it, but we found a lady had a dress on. And it was so strange, I, it shocked me. I, I said, oh, look at there, I, it looks strange, that woman's wearing a dress. The rest of them was wearing clothing, uh, didn't be, not becoming to the woman. And, um, and uh, she said, um, I said, well, that's just the American spirit, man, the spirit of America. Yeah. Now, the spirit of America, it's a, supposed to be a Christian nation, but the spirit of this nation is not Christian. Yeah. It might be called Christian nation, but it's a million miles from it in characteristic. So this woman... Uh, I said, she said, well, aren't we Americans? Said, I said, no, we live here. This is our country. We, we, we stay in it. We love it. It's the best nation in the world. But yet we are not Americans. I said, we are born from above. The Holy Spirit come down and we belong to a kingdom. It's not of this world. I said, that's the reason our sisters wear dresses. Wear long hair. Don't wear makeup. See, their characteristics identify them as holiness unto the Lord from above. Therefore, we are seeking a kingdom. We are seeking a king to come and receive his subjects to his kingdom. And they are identified by the, their characteristics that their treasures are not of this earth or of this nation. It's of above and glory. Therefore, they, they look for a city whose builder and maker is God. They are properly identified. Wish I had enough voice to preach to you some night, but uh, get off of that. Now, identified by its characteristics. We find a good example here in the time of Israel coming to the promised land. And God had called him according to his promise. He told Abraham that he would, uh, his seed would uh, be in this strange nation for 400 years, and then he would deliver him with a great, mighty hand. And they go to a land then was promised, was flowing with milk and honey. And then when that time of the promise drew nigh, there come a, a Pharaoh who didn't recognize Joseph's great ministry that he had among them. And this, God raised up a prophet named Moses. And the man was taught in all the uh, wisdom of the Egyptians. No doubt but what he was a great, smart, intellectual man. Or he could teach the Egyptians wisdom. Looked like a properly fit, fitted man for deliverance. But you see, what we call deliverance, and what God calls deliverance, is some difference. I watched this man with all of his ethics he knew he was born to deliver the children of Israel, yet with all of his education, that's all he knew about, and knowing that he was called of God to do the job, he had all his, he had his Bachelor of Art and his Ph.D. and LL.D. and so forth, and he went out to deliver Israel and was a total failure. 
Now notice, look like him being with his foot on the throne in Egypt to become the Pharaoh, that he could have delivered the children of Israel after he became Pharaoh because he was next in line for the, for the throne. But you see, that in doing it that way wouldn't identify God's characteristic in delivering his people. He said he would deliver them. He would deliver them with a mighty hand. Not Moses with a mighty army, but God with a mighty hand. We find that this prophet run away and was in the wilderness for 40 years. It take Pharaoh 40 years to drill an education into him. It took God 40 years to drill it out of him. So we find one day that he, on the backside of the desert, met the Lord God in a burning bush in the form of a pillar of fire laying in a bush. And he was asked to take off his shoes, that the ground he was standing on was holy. Now look at this fine, cultured, educated man that had been. What's the changing of his characteristics after he met God? He done the most. Sometimes God does things in such a simple way and such a foolish way to the carnal way of thinking. Notice a man who had been a total failure with all Egyptian armies and everything around him to do the will of God with all of his education at the age of 40 years old in his prime. Here he is 80 years old the next morning with his wife sitting straddle of a mule with a young and on her hip and a stick in his hand going down to Egypt to take over. You talk about a ridiculous sight, but that was displaying the characteristics of God because he had a man who would believe his word. The thing of it was, could you imagine a one-man invasion going to Egypt where an army had failed? But what was it? His characteristic, his tactics has changed. He was going in the name of the Lord. I am that I am. The thing of it was, he took over. He did because... He was going in the power of the Lord. On his road leading Israel out to the promised land, he come in contact with his brother, his denominational brother, Moab. Now, Moab by no means were heathens. That was Lot's daughter's children. One of their children had, had sprung Moab. Now, up there, I want you to notice these two nations. Nations in contrast. Here was Egypt, a little scattered about, no nation to go to, no executives or no king or nothing or any dignitaries among them, just the people on their road to a promised land. And here they had to go through the land of Moab. It was right in the line of promise. And Moab also was a believer's in Jehovah. And they had a prophet. And Israel had a prophet. Both of them had prophets. And I notice, uh, they come to the place that the prophet of the organized nation was coming down to curse this other nation because it was just a drifter, not having a certain place to stay. So they come down and watch those two prophets. When it comes fundamentally speaking, both of them are exactly right. Because Noah's Balaam, the bishop, told him, Now you build me seven altars. Seven is the complete number of God, representing the seven church ages, the seven days of creation, so forth. Now notice, seven, God is completed in seven. Seven altars. And on each altar put a, a bullock. Now, uh, that's exactly the same altar they had down in Israel's camp. Yes. There they are down in Israel Amen. with the same altar they got up here in the same sacrifice. Yes. A bullock and a bullock. A prophet and a prophet. Yes. Two nations in contrast. A very perfect example of the day we're living. Yes. We had time to go into it. Notice, God doing this in parable, we would find out paralleling. Now, also, Balaam required a ram on each altar. That was speaking of his faith in a coming Messiah. Yes. A ram. He sheep. That's the same sacrifice they had down in Israel. 
down in the camp of Israel, up here by Emoah. The fundamentally, they were both right. But notice, fundamentally in doctrine, but one prophet down in Israel's camp had the characteristics of God and the Word of God. He stayed with the promise of God for that age because he was in a line going to the promised land. Now, as far as the fundamental part, uh, Balaam, Balaam could be just as identified as Moses was. But you see, Moses, being the correct prophet of God, not only had the fundamental parts, but had the identification of God. See, he was in line of duty, exactly what was promised for that age. Not for the age of Noah, but for the age then. I will take you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. They were on their way, and Israel was identified with their prophet Moses, with the message of that age. God, characteristics identified in Moses. A pillar of fire was following him. He also had the atonement in action. Not speaking of it, but had it in action. Not what will be, what is right now. Notice, he had a brass serpent that had been lifted up for the sickness and diseases of the people. Therefore, Moses was practicing divine healing. He had the atonement, the brass serpent symbolizing that God was in the camp. And the people were looking on that brass serpent and being healed. He also had a smitten rock following him. And that was identifying God. To keep the waters of life among them. Joy and salvation. That they would not perish, but had everlasting life. It was a type of that smitten rock in the wilderness was a type of Christ being smitten. Then they were traveling in the line of promise. That was another identification. The showing God's characteristics. No matter how fundamental this other one was with the word, he had the fundamentalism plus the identification and the characteristic of God among them. God identified himself. Two prophets. Both of them prophets. Both of them fundamental. But God identified his characteristics in Moses because he had the characteristics of God with him. Now, again, God's characteristics is always supernatural because he is supernatural. God is supernatural. It's unusual always to the modern trend of thinking of the day. You know that. God's always has upset the apple cart for the for the religious groups in every age it's ever passed. And not one time did ever a person or a group of people ever organize themselves together upon a message of what they died in one of the shelf and never raised again. There's no history. The Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, and so forth. Never raised again. When they go to grouping it, God deals with individuals. Notice, he's so unusual to the way of thinking. See, we get off in a trend and we have to believe it this way. And then God comes around with his word that he's promised and identifies himself in that word. This group can't go to it because they don't believe in it. See, it's done cut itself off from it. Like Joseph, he was a son of David and a good man, Joseph, the husband of Mary. Uh, he was a good man and uh, no doubt read the Bible, the scrolls continually because and was looking for a Messiah to come and should have known what the scripture said that would take place. Isaiah said, a virgin shall conceive. Well, now he was going with this young girl, Mary, probably 18 years old. He's probably a bit older. And then. When they were engaged to get married, she shows up to be mother. Now, that was kind of hard for Joseph uh, to kind of settle on that. No doubt by what Mary told him the visit of Gabriel. But we notice the way his character was leading him, he doubted it. 
Now she was found to be mother before they were wed. And in the Bible, that punishment is death by being stoned. An uh, unwedded woman being becoming mother. She had to be stoned. There's no prostitution in Israel. It was put out. So we find out, and Deuteronomy tells us that. Now, we find that Mary looked like she was trying to use Joseph just for a shield of some act that she had done. Because if she was found already to be mother before they were married, then she must be stoned and she must have someone now that could stand as a shield for her. And that looked a whole lot like it was what she was trying to do. But Joseph, looking into her big, pretty eyes, and she'd say, Joseph, Gabriel said to me, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow thee. And this thing that will be conceived in thee, uh, in thee is of the Holy Spirit. It's God. It's what it's going to be called, the Son of God. And Joseph, he, he, he wanted to believe that. But it was so unusual. That never happened before. And that's just the way today. If we could only, if I had some way of getting the people to see that the unusualness of anything, if it's identified by the Word, then its characteristics proves what it is. It's God in action. Joseph should have known this. He should have known a virgin shall conceive. But he was honest about it. He didn't want to put her away privately, but he, he was thinking on doing it. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Did you ever wonder why he appeared in a dream? There was no prophets of them days. The dream was so simple, it needed no interpretation. Said Joseph, thou son of David, fear not taking thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Then that settled it. See, he come to him in a dream, secondarily. But to see there was no prophet there to identify that word, that this is the virgin that shall conceive. See? So therefore, he appeared to him in a dream because he was honest and just and a good man. And I believe God will come to any good man in some way and identify his doings to that good man for the age. That man's called the God for that age. Now, but it was so unusual, they just could not hardly grasp it, but always the appearing according to the promised word for the age. All this unusualness. Now, there's some people might go around and say, well, this is unusual. That's God. This is unusual. But you see, it has to be identified by the word. And the word is God. See? And then the characteristic of this identification identifies who it is. Because God said this would happen. And it happens. See, the characteristic of it is God's Word being identified by the characteristic of what's going on. He said in the last days, they pour out the Holy Ghost. He did it. The characteristics of it identify that it was God, His Word, promised. See, it always identifies itself. Now, always, every time, corrects the Word when the Word is said wrong. Did you ever notice? It was in the days of Noah that corrected that scientific age that God was going to bring water down out of the heavens. It was Moses, see, that corrected when they was all settled down in Egypt and so forth. But God's Word had to come to be identified. And the truth of the Word corrects the error. Let me ask you something. We may go a little deep here. I'm not supposed to preach teaching or doctrine. But let me just ask you one thing. Jesus was the Word. We know that. The Bible said it was. St. John, first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's still the Word. Then when he could perceive their thoughts, they ought to know that that was the Word, because the Word of God said that's what he'd do. He was the prophet. Now notice, we find out that when he was born, about 12 years of age, he went up to the feast. Of the tabernacle. And they had went up there to the Passover and on the road back, they went three days journey and they missed him. 
perceiving, thinking rather than presuming that he was out among their people. We can make a lesson out of that. That's so much today. Now, you Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever you are. See, you're doing that same thing. You're perceiving because it. Wesley had a great revival. Luther had a great revival. Or Pentecost had a great revival. You're perceiving that he's among the people when sometimes he isn't there. They went to find him. Where did they find him? Where they left him? At Jerusalem. And when they found him, what was he doing? A little boy, 12 years old, probably never entered school no more what his mother taught him. And here he was in the temple debating with those priests about the word of God. And they were astonished at the wisdom of this child. Why? He was the word. Now watch, and not, not dishonoring you Catholic people that call Mary uh, the mother of God. But just let me show you a little error here. If the church is built upon Mary, watch what happened. Now, she come up and she said, Oh, your father and I have sought thee with tears. What's that statement? She then condemned her own testimony. She said, Your father and I have sought you with tears. What's that word? He was the word. He said, Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? What's the word? Correct the error. Right there before those priests, she ruined her testimony, said she's conceived by the Holy Ghost, and here she says, Joseph is his father. Yes. See that word? Catch it right quick. Amen. He was the word. Now, you know, a 12-year-old boy wouldn't do that. No. He was the word. Amen. He was the spoken word of that age. Oh, yeah. So, therefore, the identified characteristic of God was in Christ. Yes. He corrected the errors. He said, they said, why, we are Moses' disciples. He said, if you was Moses' disciples, you'd know me. He wrote of me. Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like me. You would know me if you knew Moses. And uh, see, the word always corrects the error of the day. But the people don't like to believe it. They hang right on just the same. But Jesus corrected his own mother. And his mother was in the wrong. Because she'd already said that that was a child conceived in her by the Holy Ghost. And here she turns her testimony around and said that Joseph was her father, was the father of, of Jesus. Now, if, if Joseph, if he was the son of Joseph, if he had been about his father's business, he'd been down the carpenter shop. But he was about his father's business up there in the temple rebuking those organizations. Amen. He was about his father's business. Just a 12-year-old lad. Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? Did you notice when Jesus was tempted by Satan, his characteristic there when he was in his temptation identified him to be God because he stayed with the Word. It is written, said Satan. Jesus said it's also written. Stayed right with the Word. God, in sundry times we read here, God in sundry times, that's old times, divers manners, many ways, identified himself to his prophets by visions. That was the characteristic of a prophet was when he foretold things and it happened. Now that was his characteristic of his identification that God was with him. Then that gave him the rights to interpret the word for that day because the word of God come to the prophets. Amen. The characteristic of the prophet that he foretold. The Bible said, if there be one, and what he says comes to pass, then you hear it. But if it doesn't, don't believe him. Don't fear him. But my, I, if my word's not in him. But if it does come to pass, then my word's in him. Amen. That's his identification. That's the characteristic of a prophet. Now, God in sundry times, that's how he showed his characteristics of identification of himself to man. By speaking to a man that was called to be a prophet. Now, the Bible says that God in sundry times, diverse manners, spoke to the fathers, to the prophets. We also read over in Second Peter that the whole word of God was wrote by him. Man of old, moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote the Bible. They were prophets, the word come to them, and they wrote it. 
wrote it down under inspiration. First, they were identified prophets, then they, they wrote the word of inspiration. And they had the interpretation of the divine revelation, because it was God in the man. And that's why he showed himself in his characteristics of identification. Their visions being the vindicated was God's characteristic in them, making himself known to the people. And that's the only way he was in Christ. A prophet was just a little speck. Christ was the fullness of God. And God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and his characteristics identified him. What he was. In so much that he said, if I do not the works of my father, then don't believe him. If I don't have the character of my father, then don't believe me. Don't believe my claims. If I haven't got the character of my father in me, then don't believe it at all. Now, his characteristics never changes. God cannot change his character no more than, than a, a lamb can change his character or any other thing char- changes his characteristics. Because as long as it's in its original, it's original. And if you change anything, then you've changed it from its original. It's just like you can take a, a hog and you can wash a hog and, and put that paint on his toenails like the women does and fix it up with lipstick. And put her on a nice dress, turn that old sow out, she'd go right straight to the water and water again. Why? She's a hog. Amen. That's all. But, and, uh, but you know, you wouldn't make, a lamb wouldn't do that. He won't even get in that mud. He don't want nothing to do with it. Amen. It's the characteristics of it, see? You might dress him in the same kind of clothes, but he sure won't, he sure won't go, the outside doesn't matter, it's the inside. Now, God being the Source of all life. Don't fail to get this. If I'm trying, or always this in me, to get you to see something. See? It's to your good, friends. It's for your be- behalf. See? I didn't come here just to be seen. I didn't come here there was no other place to go. I've come here because I felt to come here. I felt that the ministry the Lord had given me must be shown amongst the people here. And I'm trying to get you to see what God really is now. He's his promised word. He always is the word. And he identifies himself by the characteristic that he promised a certain character would rise in a certain time. That's in the word. Then the characteristic of this person is supposed to rise identifies that that is the person. That's the reason Jesus had to be who he was. They should have seen it. No wonder they were blind. The thing said, though he had done so many miracles, yet they could not believe because Isaiah said they got eyes and can't see and ears and can't hear. Each age, not only his age, but every age, how God and sundry times, diverse manners. Still, they just couldn't get it. Now, his characteristics never fails. It always is the same. Now, remember... His characteristic, the characteristic of God cannot fail. Amen. If it does, then God's fail. Amen. And the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, he is the unchangeable God. Whatever character he was at the beginning, he is still that same character. Amen. Every way he worked, any time he ever done anything, he does it the same way every time. If he doesn't, it's, his character's changed. See? And his characteristics would display something that wasn't of God. See? So we wouldn't know where. Like Paul said, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will know to prepare for battle? If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound. Now, if the trumpet is supposed to sound retreat, that's what we got to do, retreat. Yeah. If the trumpet sounds charge, that's what we're supposed to do, is charge. Yeah. But what is a trumpet? Is the Word of God. Amen. It identifies God. Whether it's, whether it's go up, sit down, retreat, stack arms, whatever it is. It's God's trumpet sound. And an uncertain sound, when the Bible says a certain thing's supposed to happen, somebody says, well, that's another day, that's, and he's an uncertain sound there. And you don't know what to do. Jesus said, I have power to lay my life down and raise it up again. No uncertain sound there. The woman said, we know Messiah cometh. And when he cometh, he'll tell us the things like he did. He said, I'm he. No uncertain sound there. 
I am He. They said, our fathers eat men in the wilderness. He said, they're every one day. He said, but I am the bread of life that come from God out of heaven. No uncertain sound. I'm the tree of life from the Garden of Eden. No, no uncertain sound about that. Certainly not. Nothing uncertain about it. He was certain in everything that he did. The Bible don't give an uncertain sound. It identifies the characteristic of God in its sounding. Jesus said in St. John 10, 37, If I do not the works of my Father, and I don't have that character of my Father, then don't believe me. They are the one, they identify his character in me, his characteristics, because the Father is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And the characteristic of God is displayed by his promise for that age. Now, if he had lived in Moses' time, it wouldn't have worked. And if Moses had lived in his time, it wouldn't have worked. If he had lived in Noah's time, it wouldn't work if Noah had lived in his time. Noah was prophesying of things for that day. And his characteristic and what he done identified him with the Word of God. Moses did the same thing. And here Jesus come and the Word is promised for that age is identified in Jesus Christ by the characteristic of the Word which is God. Amen. 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 The pouring out of the Holy Ghost in the last days upon the common people has identified God's characteristic with the people. He promised that it's a word. He said he'd do it. Amen. Nobody can take it back. He said he would do it. So all these things that he's promised, that's what he does. It identifies his characteristic. Yes, sir. Don't believe it. Don't believe my claims if my characteristic isn't that of God. Now notice, in John fourteen twelve, He that believeth on me, he said, has my identification. My characteristic, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. That identifies that the character of Christ is in him displaying the characteristics of him. Amen. Amen. I feel pretty religious right now if I am, Holy sir. Yes, sir. Oh, my. See, there's no mistake about it. His life, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. See, that identifies the characteristics. Same thing he said. If my character doesn't identify myself, God in, in him, then he don't believe him. Now, he also said that he would be identified in that. Then that, if it doesn't identify him, then he isn't what he says. And today, if Christ doesn't identify himself, the characteristic of Christ identify us as being of Christ, believing the word, Jesus was the Word, so he had to believe the Word. Amen. And how can we say that we are of Christ and deny any word in that Bible? Amen. The Holy Spirit of Christ is God in you. And it will punctuate every promise with an amen. The Bible said, these signs shall follow them that lead. The Spirit of God said, amen. Hmm? One of them, don't say, no, that is for another age, that is for disciples only. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He, anywhere, in all the world that believeth. Amen. These signs shall follow him. Yeah. Same thing. Same yesterday, today, and forever. The characteristic being identified. That makes Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1, God of sundry times, speaking to the fathers by the prophets, identifying Christ. Resurrected today by the same characteristic that he did in sundry times. Did you notice? God never changes his way in the old Bible. When a dreamer dreamed a dream, and there was no prophet in the land to see if this dream was right or not, they had another way of finding out. They took that character, ever who dreamed the dream, took him down to the temple. The breastplate of Aaron, who was a high priest, hung on the post. And this dreamer told this dream, no matter how good it sounds, how real it sounds, if there wasn't a supernatural light flashed on those uh, stones, which is called Urim Thunder, Bible readers understand, then I don't care how real it sounded, it wasn't so. The unusualness of God, the character of God had to display his characteristics in the supernatural to show that he identified himself on the message. Amen. Amen. I say the same thing tonight. The old Urim of Thundam's gone, but the Word's still the thing that identifies the characteristics of God. The promise of the hour that we're living. 
There is God's characteristics identified by the promise of the hour that we're living in. That makes God the same as he was in sundry times. Look, in divers manners, he spake to the fathers by the prophets. And the law and prophets were until John, since then the kingdom of heaven. Notice, but in this last day, speaking the same thing he did then, through his son, Christ Jesus. God in sundry times, divers manners, spake to the fathers through the prophets. In this last day, doing the same thing, speaking to the people, the fathers, through his son, Christ Jesus, has raised him up from the dead, and he lives within us, identifying himself and foretelling us things, and he's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, in sundry time, in divers manner, spake to the fathers, through the prophets, but in this last day, through Jesus Christ, his son. The Scripture cannot be tampered with. It's exactly, as I've said before, God don't need anybody to interpret this word. He interprets his own word. When he says anything, it happens. That's the interpretation. He don't need anyone to say, well, I believe it means this. God identifies it by his own interpretation. If the promise is for that day, we can't live in the light of, of, of Luther. We can't live in the light of Wesley. We can't live in the light of any of those. We got to live in the light. It's promised for this day. What if Moses would have went down in Egypt and said, well, we're going to build a big ark. We're going to float out of this country. The Nile is going to come up. They look back in the scroll. There's no promise of that. That's right. But you see, he identified himself as God's prophet for what he said come to pass. Then they know he had the word of the Lord. Pharaoh had spears, but Moses had the word. <laughs> so when they got to the sea, the spears all went under the sea, and Moses took Israel across the sea on dry land because he had the word. And he was the word of that hour. Amen. Moses was the word made manifest for that hour. Elijah was the word made manifest for that hour. Amen. Christ is the word made manifest. And the promises that he made, a little while in the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you do also. He promised these things. What is it? It's the characteristic of God displaying his word like he did in all ages. Malachi 4, he said, before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come, behold, I send unto you Elijah the prophet, and he will restore the faith of the children back to the fathers again before that day comes. He promised it. Jesus said in the 17th chapter of St. Luke, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man when the Son of Man is being revealed. When the revelation is unfolding itself in the days when the world will be like Sodom, what will it be? The characteristic of that scripture being fulfilled. Amen. God identifying himself by his characteristics. Characteristics that he's always been. He cannot leave them. The last days, he identified through his son. Notice how God does these always at the, uh, as he, all, he never changes his way. These three men that talked to Abraham, as we were just speaking there, at the days of Sodom. Abraham was a man who believed God. He took God at his promise. Sarah, his wife, was 65 years old. Abraham was 75 when God called him. He said, there's going to have a, a child. Abraham would have a child by Sarah. It might sound a little ridiculous, but I imagine she got all the, the little booties and pins and everything ready because she's going to have this baby. After the first 28 days, why, Abraham might have said, Sarah, how you feel, darling? No different. Glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. How you know? God said so. A year passed. How you feel, dear? No different. We're going to have it anyhow. God said so. Five years passed. How you feeling out, dear? No different. We're going to have it anyhow. God said so. What was it? He had the promise of God. He believed God. And he acted like God. He held on to the promised word. It, Twenty-five years passed. The booties had done turned the island. But she still held on to him. Now he's old and stooped over and He's in a terrible shape, and Sarah's womb is good as dead, and he's sterile. What a condition they're in. How you feel, Abraham, father of nations? Is 
make believers, friends, and say to him, Well, glory to God, I feel fine. We're going to have that baby anyhow. Because he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God. For he was fully persuaded that what God said, God's able to perform. There's a characteristic of a believer. What about you? What about we, the children of Abraham? Are we identified with the word of God as a promise? And our characteristic identifies herself that we actually believe it. Or do we just him haul jump from here and over here and down here and guess and him haul around about it? Then we're not Christians. We're just making believe. But when we really stand to that promise, tow it right there and stay with it. Abraham did. Now we find out one day he saw three men come walking. The Bible says here it was in the heat of the day. It must have been about noon. These men walked up and was talking to him. We understand that two of them went out in Sodom. I believe we spoke on it the other night. One of them stayed with him. Watch this man that he called to stay with him, what the man did. One was identified by his characteristic that he was Elohim. Elohim, the very first word in the Bible, in the beginning, God. Now, any of you scholars know that that word God there means in the Hebrew is Elohim, which means the almighty, the all-sufficient, the self-existing. Needs no help from nobody. Needs nobody's interpretation. He does his own. He's the all-sufficient God. Omnipresent, omnipotent, omnipotent. He's God. There he was. And Abraham now, this patriarch who had a hold of the word, looked at this fella. And when this fella had his back turned to the tent, he said, where is your wife Sarah? said, she's in the tent behind you. Said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life and you'll have this baby, I promise you. And Sarah laughed about it, and the one was talking to him, told him what Sarah said in the tent behind him. Now in Genesis you read that. We find out that then Abraham, after this man had identified himself, what was it? Hebrews fourth chapter, the twelfth verse said. The word of God is sharper, more powerful than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He knew that this was the man. He knew there's no prophets in the land but him. And therefore, the word of the Lord had come to him, and he was the prophet, and here the word come to the prophet. Amen. Same thing with John the Baptist. Yes. There had not been a prophet for 400 years. I remember maybe old Dr. Davis is sitting here tonight. The old missionary Baptist preacher that baptized me in the faith he used to argue with me. He said, Billy, you're just a kid now. You have to listen to me. I said, all right. Brother Davis, I'm listening. He said, you see, John was not baptized. So he had been baptized, but hadn't been baptized. Nobody's worthy to baptize him. That's good Baptist theology. And here comes Jesus and said, then John said, I have need to be baptized to thee. Why come thou to me? And he said, suffer to be so. He said, and then when he suffered him, he said, you see, then Jesus baptized John. And when he went out of the water, then the heavens opened. He saw God in the form of a dove coming down and going on. He said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm pleased to dwell in. But no, not disagreeing with Dr. Davis, but he was wrong. See, John was the prophet. And the word always comes to the prophet. So if the word was made flesh, it had to come to the prophet anyhow. Because he is testifying of the word and his very characteristic identified him that. Here comes the word. Now, what happened? As soon as he walked into the face of Jesus, John said, I have need to be baptized of thee. Why comest thou to me? Jesus said, Suffer it to be so. For thus it is becoming to us, behooveth us, to fulfill all righteousness. John, being the prophet, him being the word, he was the sacrifice, and he was six to enter his earthly ministry, and the sacrifice had to be washed before it was presented. Yes. John baptized him, because he knows, suffer that to be so, for thus it's becoming to us to fulfill all righteousness. The sacrifice had to be uh, washed before presented. And so John baptized him. Well, not Jesus baptizing John. John baptized Jesus. Suffer it to be so. Notice here was Abraham, and he had the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord come to him. He was the prophet. And now, here comes the word. 
He called him Abraham, not Abram. A few days before that, his name was Abram. Was Abram. Now it's Abraham. His wife is Sarah. Now it's Sarah. Not S-A-R-A-S-A-R-A-H. Not A-B-R-A-H-A-M. A-B-R-A-M, but A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Abraham. And this man identified himself when he said, Abraham. Oh, my. Abraham said, Elohim. (laughs) There's the word and the prophet together. Uh, Both characters identifying. Elohim. He said, where is your wife? Sarah. Said she's in the tent behind you. And then the miracle was done. Elohim. Abraham called him the all-sufficient, almighty, omnipotent God. Jesus said, when he was on earth, he did the same thing that Elohim did. That identified his characteristic as being God. And he said before, in the last days, just at the coming of the Son of Man, when he's being revealed, this setting will take place again like it was at Sodom. Elohim among his people. Almighty God. That's what the Scripture says. Elohim among the people. For 40 years, he's been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Elohim, God, and the church. Look, Abraham seen one sign, another calling, a sign, a calling, a calling, a sign, waiting for that promised son. But the last sign that he saw, the last appearing, the last visit of God, before the promised son arrived on the scene, was Elohim in human flesh. Then the promised son comes. And Abraham's seed is waiting for the promised son, Jesus Christ. And they've seen signs of pouring out of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, divine healing, and so forth. But when the Son of Man is being revealed, Elohim will return back to the royal seed of Abraham and show that same thing that he showed in that day. Amen. Elohim. As it was. Why? It would be the characteristic of God. Now, if Christ was God, yet a little while the world sees me more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the consummation, the end. The works that I do, shall you do also. Jesus said that in, in Luke, the 17th chapter. All right. When we believe and see these last days, this setting is to be reacted again. Therefore, Hebrews 1, 1, God in sundry times, by the prophets, identified himself in this last days has identified the resurrection of his son from the dead by giving the church the same characteristic that he had, making Hebrews 13, 8 exactly right. Amen. Amen. No feathers can be picked out of that. That's eagle feathers. They stay tiny because they're heavenly birds. They feed some eagle food. Amen. Now, we notice... That in the sundry times, divers' manner, he spoke to the fathers, to the prophets, in the last days to his son Jesus Christ, by raising him up from the dead. And here he is among us after 2,000 years. The same Jesus. Not one of the prophets. Jesus. Hallelujah. The resurrected Son of God. Jesus said one day, he said, a wicked and adulterous generation seek after a sign. And they'll get a sign. A wicked and adulterous generation. When was the world any more wicked or adultery and perverted than it is now? As it was in the days of Jonas. As Jonas was in the belly of the whale for three days and nights, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and nights. Then a wicked and adulterous generation was to receive a sign. What kind of a sign? A sign of the resurrection. Amen. And we have it today after 2,000 years. He's yes. still alive. Yes. He's among us tonight, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Identifying himself by the characteristics of God manifesting the word in this day that he promised to do. Amen. Amen. There's the word. How will you believe the sign? It's the next thing. Last days, his identification by his son. Notice, God spake to Moses in sundry times in the Deuteronomy 18, 15. said, The Lord your God shall raise a prophet like unto me. Now watch. 
That's the Word. That is the Word. That was God. That wasn't Moses. How would Moses know that? He was the man. But God speaking through Moses said this. You believe that? Yes. All right. Now, notice Jesus. Watch how his, his characteristics identified this promised word true. He certainly did. He was identified by this characteristic that Moses said he would be. Many of them, like today, they want to see some great leader. Oh, this is Dr. P.H. So-and-so. He's out of Hartford University or he's out of some great big somewhere like that. That's no identification of God. No, no. Not a thing about it. The words what identifies God. Jesus was not a scholar. Neither was he a priest. Neither was he a rabbi to the world. He was a renegade to the world. But God was confirming his word to him, which made him Emmanuel. That was his identification. Now, here are Jesus meeting this exactly what God in sundry times said he would do. Through Moses, what he would do. Now watch. When he met Peter, as we dramatized it the other night. When he met Peter and told Peter what his name was, this sign identified his Messiah claims to Peter. For the word had said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet. And Peter come up, which was Simon then, come up where he was at. And Jesus looked at him and said, your name is Simon and you are the son of Jonas. That identified the character of Christ to be that word that Moses promised. Peter recognized that that sign identified Jesus as Messiah. God was in Christ, the anointing for the last days. To Nathaniel, remember, he told Simon his name. Now watch. To Nathaniel, he told what he had done. You were under the tree when I saw you. That identified him, Messiah, said, you are the Son of God. Amen. You are the King of Israel. He was identified by the characteristic of the promised word that he was to be the Messiah. The Lord your God shall raise a prophet. The little woman at the well, he told her what she was. And that identified him as this promised Messiah. See, his character, his characteristics was the word being identified was his characteristics showing that the word was God. So that was God being identified in Christ. Amen. Watch it. No. To Peter, he was identified to Peter by calling his name. He was identified to Nathaniel by telling him what he done. He was identified by the woman by telling what she was. What he, who he was, what he done, and what she was. He identified his Messiah characteristic that was the, to be the characteristic of the Messiah. Look at the little woman say the same thing. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We haven't had a prophet for hundreds of years. We've had plenty of church, plenty of pluses, and denominational difference, but we haven't had a prophet for hundreds of years. We know that when Messiah cometh, this is what will identify him. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. Nothing uncertain about it. I am he. That identified him. The woman with the blood issue identified him the word. Wow. By what he done when her faith touched him. He turned around and said, who touched me? He knows something happened that identified Jesus as Messiah. She believed it. And she said, if I can touch his garment, I'll be made well. So as soon as she touched, he turned. Said, now who touched me? And they all denied it. But his Messiah characteristic. Amen. Amen. I hope you see that congregation. Yes. Listen as we're closing. There. She touched him. There was hundreds maybe trying to touch him. Peter even rebuked him. Said, well, all of them touching him. He said, yes, but somebody touched me different. That's that different. That faith touch. He said, somebody touch me. It was a different touch. I got weak. Strength went out of me. Virtue's gone from me. Now, there he stands. Now, even his own disciple saying, in other words, you sound, sound like you were some delinquent person. Well, people, everybody's touching. Watch his, watch his identification. He turned around, looked through the crowd. He singled her right out. She couldn't hide herself any longer. He told her of her condition and said her faith had made her well. 
She knows by this that Hebrews 4, 12, the word discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. His characteristic identified him to be the word of God made flesh and dwelling among us. Amen. Amen. I think the same thing tonight identifies him, the resurrected Jesus Christ living among us tonight. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, as Hebrews 13, 8 is true, his character will identify him today as it did then. The same manner. Look at uh, Theophis and them at the resurrection. Jesus identified himself the way he broke that bread. They had done it just the way he did it before he was crucified. And they, that identified his characteristics because that's the way he did it. Now, if he was here tonight, how would he identify himself? It's like he did yesterday. Yes. Or it's the same today and will be forever. Amen. It's an identification. Hebrews 4, 4 uh, 14 and 15, he is now, says, he is our high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He is our high priest. Right now. After his resurrection. Amen. After his death. Amen. After his burial. After his resurrection. After his ascension. Amen. Amen. He still remains. Amen. The same yesterday, today, and forever. A high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Amen. He's that right now. To every man and woman here that will believe it. He is our high priest. Same yesterday, today, and forever. He ever lives. Do you believe that? His characteristics continually identify him the same as he was when he lived on earth. He's still living here tonight in the form of the Holy Spirit. He ever lives. And his characteristics follow him just as it always did if he's still a living. I'm thankful tonight that God in sundry times and divers manners spake to the fathers to the prophets in this last days through his son, Jesus Christ. Oh, I didn't know I'd talk that long. I forgot about it being like that. I'm sorry. I just, I'll stop. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, great, merciful God. Lord, I, I, maybe I talk too much. I pray, God, if I did, I, you forgive me. But, Lord, I cannot ask forgiveness for what I said. I said just what you said in your word here. Now, just a word or two from you, Lord. Maybe it, everyone here will see it tonight. The little sick people will be healed when they see that you're still our great high priest. I pray, Lord, in these next few minutes that you'll make this message live again in reality. And what I've said by word, may your characteristic identify you among us tonight that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Just a moment now. We are, I, I'm just a little late, but would you all suffer long enough to have a little prayer line for 15, 20 minutes? If you will, hold up your hand and say, we, thank, thank you. I promise to let you out at 9.30. It's that time now. It's 20 minutes still. So if you'll just give me about 10 minutes, I'll hurry right up. Uh, let's see. What did prayer cards need to get out today? Oh, what where did we start the other night? One? One? I think it was one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we, last night, we just, the Holy Spirit, I was listening today, repeating what was said. Some of them French names, I, the Holy Spirit, the only way I could do just wait and see. See, sometimes when you see a vision, it's got to be turned around and translated. It's interpreted. A vision. Like you'd, you'd see a, a sheep. That might mean wool. See, you have to have also the translation of it. See? And turn that vision around and translate it. And I noticed last night I, I couldn't pronounce those French names. I had to spell it out. In Africa and around those Hottentots and heathens and things, it would ever spell their name right out tell them who they were. Spell it right out in their language. They didn't know what it was, so you just spell it out. But, see? but he knows all languages. Amen. He's the eternal God. Let's start tonight from, let's say... 75 to 100 and old. It's old. Is that what he said? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. All right. Uh, who's got prayer card 75? Let's see it. An old. Prayer card old 75. Raise up your hand. Ever who has it. Old. All right. Come right over here. 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100. Come this way, if you will. 
All right, so line right up over here right quick because we won't have time. I'm going to just trust that you'll do it. Look at your prayer card. Look at your neighbor's prayer card. What if, if somebody's crippled up, move them right up in the prayer line. So if they got O, like uh, this O, 75 to 100. Line up right over here, if you will. Wherever you are in the balconies, wherever we're come right down and come to the line as quick as possible, if you will. So to save time. Now, the rest of you here that does not have a prayer card, will you raise your hands and say, I haven't got a prayer card, Brother Bram, but I believe. Raise your hands. Now, remember, I'm going to talk to you about the high priest. He is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord's provided sacrifice. He's Jehovah Raphi, the Lord that heals all thy diseases. you believe that? He's Jehovah Manasseh, a buckler, a shield, a peace. He's still. Well, how many believe that all those redemptive names of Jehovah was applied to Jesus? Sure, he had to be. If he, if he, well, he can't, they're inseparable, so he had to be all of them. If he's still Jehovah Jireh, he's Jehovah Rapha. If he's Jehovah Jireh, he's a, a Jehovah Jireh is the Lord's provided sacrifice for salvation. Then he's Jehovah Rapha that heals all of our diseases. Amen. Healing can only come by God. All right, well, I'll let people line up. I haven't got time to see who they are and what they are. But now, all out there that knows that I don't know you, raise up your hand. Say, I have a need of God, but you don't know me, Brother Bram. But I have a need of God. I'm just going to raise my hand. Now, if you just settle for a few minutes, watch, be careful, be quiet. Now, I don't mean when I say be quiet. If the Lord does anything, you want to praise the Lord, that's worship. But what I mean, just run around, get up, you know, that's irreverent. See, the Holy Spirit's very timid, very timid. See, just anything like that just leaves me, and I just have to battle in again, see. But if you listen, remember his first promise? Get the people to believe you and then be sincere. Nothing will stand before the prayer. You remember that? Amen. Uh, that's, I haven't seen it fail yet, and it won't fail. God. Amen. Now, we'll hurry with the prayer line so we get as many through as we can on count of people. But you just got prayer cards and not call tonight. Hold your card. We're going to get you. All right? Now, you out there without prayer cards, remember, are you out there, whether you have prayer cards or not, just believe that he is, like Hebrews, the fourth chapter here, he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. See if he remains, see if Jehovah has represented himself among his people like he did at the days of Sodom. All right. All right, sir. Now, let's pray to be real river. Now, remember, a word from God more than anybody could say. Now, this man here, I, I don't know him, and I guess he's, you're a stranger to me, or he says, you're a stranger. We know one thing, that we've both got to stand in the presence of God someday, as man, we've got to meet there. This is our first time meeting. Now, if you come here, if you are sick, I don't know, it might be something else. See, but if I, if I laid hands on you and say, praise the Lord, go get well, that's all right, you can believe that. Well, what if he tells you what's wrong with you? Now, see, that's different. Then you know that identifies his characteristic. See, that wouldn't be my characteristic. I'm a man. I wouldn't know nothing about him. I just told him, I don't know you. He don't know me. But what would that do? That would identify the characteristic of Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Knowing that it couldn't be me. Couldn't be me because I don't know the man. I raise my hand. Here's the word. See, I don't know him. He don't know me. But the characteristic of Jesus Christ... If Jesus is standing here and he's sick, if he'd say, Lord Jesus, heal me, what would Jesus say to him? I've already done it. Is that right? He was wounded for our transgression. With his stripes, we were healed. All the redemption that we ever can have was settled at Calvary. From there on, it's faith to believe the finished work. Is that right? All right. Now, now, if Jesus is alive, and I've talked of his word... There you are, back to that simplicity and faith, believing his word. When he met me that night, he said, you'll come to pass that you'll even know the secrets of their heart. They won't believe that first sign of the hand. They will have to believe this one. If they don't do that, then blood curses the earth. Just like it did in Moses' time. He said, won't believe that two signs, then pour blood upon the earth. Pour water upon the earth and become blood. Now... Just to uh, find out and you see what your trouble is. That would satisfy and make you believe what you know it had to be the characteristic of the person I'm talking about, Jesus Christ. A man, 
as I look at him, moves back, he's shattered. There isn't a thing that medicine would ever help the man. He's in a dying condition. That's right. He's had an operation. And the operation was a prostate operation. And it's cancer. And the cancer scattered all through you. If that's right, raise up your hand. Hallelujah. Only God can do But look, Hallelujah. I want to say something to you, sir. That devil might have hid from the doctor's knife, but he can't hide from God. Amen. You believe that? You believe that? Oh, and I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, may the thing leave you, may the man live. Nothing just got weak. All right? You and I are strangers to each other. A man and a woman meet. Now, as a man, I don't know you. And perhaps as a woman, you don't know me. No more than you just see my name or picture or something like that. But we don't know one another. That's our character. We don't know one another's character. But the characteristic of Christ, He's the Word. And the Word is promised for this day. You heard me speak of it. Then His characteristics would identify Him here. Not me identify Him. I don't know Him. You understand? Do I understand that? I, I'm a man. I'm just your brother. Like the woman at the well. Say something's wrong, something's wrong with you. Or what you want, or what you're here for. Let God be the judge of that. You are suffering from a anemia condition. That is right, isn't it? I, I constantly hit that somebody thinking, I guess it. I don't guess that. No. Every once in a while I feel that somebody, you can't hide your thoughts now. Now he's about, I know two real bad skeptics sitting here. So now remember, I can call your name too. God can. Well, you quit thinking that. Let me show you. Look here, lady. Look at me. I don't know what he told you. But I, I know what he is. And that's his characteristic identified. Yes, it's anemia condition of blood, water. Now, here, here's something. Sit and this is getting you. Got a child here praying for you, Jim. That's right. It's got uh, in his throat, tonsils, abnormal. It's up for an operation, isn't it, right? Take that handkerchief and put on it and believe. Don't doubt. It won't need it. How do you do? The thing is, for this woman here, that you are scared about something. You're afraid that a birthmark has turned to cancer. <laughs> Now, go believe me. It won't be that way. You go believe him with all your heart. Characteristic. Not of me, of him. You believe now? That should make everybody believe. Now, I don't know you. I'm a stranger to you. God knows you. You believe that you know that I don't know you. You know you don't know me. So, do you believe that this spirit that's speaking cannot be my spirit? Because me as a man, I don't know you. But the characteristic of the promised word is the word that's sharper than a two-edged sword and discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. You are very sick. You had a woman's trouble, which was a wound. And that wound had cancer. And you went and take some sort of a treatment. It's a radiant treatment. And the only thing you've done is scatter it all through you. And you'll, you'll die if God don't heal you. That's true. You believe now he will heal you? May the God of heaven rebuke that devil that's hid from the doctor. You might have hide from raving, but not from the Holy Ghost. Don't believe him. Don't doubt it all. Oh, God. Do you believe that God can heal that asthmatic condition, make you well? you believe it? Then go on your road, rejoice, and say, Thank you, Lord. I believe my ass is done. How do you do? You're nervous. You've been nervous for a long time. In that, it's called the peptic ulcer. Come to your stomach, which makes you your stomach trouble. You want you want to eat your supper? Will you do what I tell you to do? Go eat in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you believe with all your heart? You're a mighty fine young lady looks to be. Do you believe me to be his servant? Do you believe his characteristic to be here to uh, the word itself, the promise of this day, the works that I do shall you also? I can't heal. He's already did that. But his characteristics displays and can tell what's wrong with you. You got a lady's trouble, female trouble. 
You believe that God heals it now? Go on your road in my body. Do you believe me to be His servant? If God will tell me what's your trouble, will you believe it's a characteristic of Jesus Christ? It's in your back. It isn't. No more. Go believe it. You also have stomach trouble. Believe with all your heart and go eat your supper. Forget about it. Jesus Christ makes you well. Come. Your trouble is your blood. Your diabetes. You believe that God will make you well and heal you of that? Go on your road and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Go believe it. Go on your back. Come. Your back. You believe that God will heal the back and make you well? Go on your road and rejoice and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. You also had something wrong with your back. Just keep on walking and say, thank you, Lord, and heal you. Believe it with all your soul. You also had back trouble. What do you know about that? Believe with all your heart and go on your road and be made well. Believe Jesus Christ and make you well. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. What if I didn't say nothing to you? Just pass by and lay hands on her. You believe she'd get well. They see what's wrong. You believe she wouldn't come here. I resist this devil in the name of Jesus Christ. May the power of God be on the Go down. Go down. If God doesn't heal you, you'll be on a crutch someday with arthritis. But you believe that God heals your arthritis? Then go say, thank you, Lord. I believe it. And you make me better. Come down. It's really your age. You're real nervous. You get real nervous late in the evening when you work and everything. You're real nervous. You believe now? You won't bother you anymore. You grab your road and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, sir. Do you believe that God heals heart trouble? Will make your heart well? Just keep on moving. Say, thank you, Lord. I believe God heals TV and makes well too. you believe that, sir, with all your heart? All right, go on your road rejoice and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. What about you out there? Do you believe? How about the audience? Some of you in the audience now believe. This man sitting right here with bronchitis, you believe that God will heal the bronchial trouble? All right, you can have what you'd ask for. Amen. High blood pressure sitting right behind him. Do you believe that God will heal your high blood? It left you, sir. I don't know him. Ever seen him in my life? Say, sir, do you believe that them spasms in your muscles, nervous muscles, spasms, you believe that God will make it well? You do? Raise up your hand if you believe. All right. Your wife sitting there, she's bothered with sinus trouble. You believe it leaves you too, sister? A lady sitting right behind us there has neuritis. Do you believe that God will heal your neuritis, lady? Here's a lady with a little co- red coat on here. She's sitting there, she has sinus trouble too. You believe that God will heal your sinus trouble? Raise up your hand if you believe it. Anybody in here that believes that the characteristics of Jesus Christ is among us tonight, raise up your hand and say, I believe it. All that's in here will accept him as your healer. Stand up on your feet and say, I believe it. Raise up. Stand up. Out of your chairs. Whatever it is. Jesus Christ say yesterday, today, and forever. I give it to you in the name of the Lord God.